you are listening to Kubernetes Byte, a podcast bringing you the latest from the world of cloud-native data management. My name is Ryan Walner, and I'm joined by Bob and Shaw, coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. We'll be sharing our thoughts on recent cloud-native news and talking to industry experts about their experiences and challenges managing the wealth of data in today's cloud-native ecosystem. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. We're coming to you from Boston, Massachusetts. Today is February 23rd, 2024. I hope everyone is doing well and staying safe. Let's dive into it. 2024. I still am getting the date wrong, by the way. I had to go to town to like do something the other day, and I had to fill out paperwork, and the lady watching me was like... It, 24, 24, because I was writing 23. <laughs> I had to do it all over again. I don't know how long, long it still takes you. In. Go I know, on. I, 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 usually doesn't take me this long, but I, for some reason, still yeah. getting it wrong, by the way. I think it's about like writing anything. Like I, I haven't written 2024, so maybe maybe it happens to me, but yeah. That's a good point. I yeah. don't know how often I do like actually handwrite stuff. So yeah. that could be part of the issue. Yep. <laughs> your, your hand is just back in last year. <laughs> Catching up. <laughs> How's it going, Bobbin? Oh, I'm doing good. I like uh, I'm doing good in general, uh, but last couple of days I've been a bit sick, so I'm glad that you're back. Welcome back, dude. Like I'll talk, uh, <laughs> I'll talk more for you then. Yeah, a lot of people are sick. Yeah, and thank you. You know, uh, it was uh, a nice little hiatus there. Had to uh, kind of get back to some family stuff yeah. right now, but it's good to be back. Uh, I know. to the Kubernetes bites and have our usual banter, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do any banter over the last few episodes, like last three episodes, because I was like. Just that, that I didn't want to sound like a monologue or like a, a stand up performance. Like, no, this is that's not the point of this podcast. Right? It's you just want like, to practice nice your stand up? You could no. have had like a, a big, a big head of me. Uh, that you oh, just, nice. Like, behind you, in the <laughs> <laughs> you know, I will lose audience if I start doing <laughs> stand up or any sort Why of is monologue. This guy talking to himself, I don't get it. <laughs> No, I'm glad that you're back. I always had like, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but like the end of our episodes where we sign off, as, and sure I, I always fumbled that part up and I had to re-record it. And then I don't know, it didn't feel <laughs> natural to me. So I'm glad that you're back and you can sign us off. <laughs> yeah, you should have like paused and then, and just like turned, like went and became me and was like, I'm Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I should try that next time. Whenever you take, decide to take like a week off, yeah, I, I'll do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, better better to just probably make a different ending. But yeah, I didn't, yeah. I didn't realize that. That's too funny. <laughs> well, um, it is good to be back. And I know uh, today's uh, episode, we don't have a guest. It's me and you. So it should mm-hmm. be just a super little fun episode here. Um, and we'll introduce the topic in quite uh, just a little bit. Uh, but, you know, you have a couple news stories here. Why don't we dive in there? Yeah, let's start with some news, right? So Strimzy uh, is now a CNCF incubation project. So Strimzy, S-T-R-I-M-Z-I, I I guess, uh, I don't know, it's difficult to pronounce. It's a weird spelling. But if you search Kafka on Kubernetes, even right now, Strimzy is the first three results. So it was a Red Hat open source project, uh, which was started in 2017. They gave it to or submitted it to CNCF as a sandbox project in 2019. And now officially it's in the incubation phase. Uh, It it makes deployment of Kafka easier on your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, again, Red Hat is, is a force in itself. So if they are contributing to a project, you know that they have taken care of all the features. Uh, for Kafka users, it supports both the, the Zookeeper mode, which is the older mode, and the new craft-based uh, uh, cluster consensus mode as well. Yeah. Uh, and overall, right, it's an operator, so it simplifies day zero and day two deployments. Yeah, you know, it's it's nice to actually, well, I don't know if it's nice or not, but it's, it, you know, new projects are still kind of forming around um, creating databases, data services on Kubernetes. And I think yeah. this is just like, how do we make it easier, right? It's always, yep. every one of these new projects has that theme. Uh, I think I just saw another one I was less familiar with, MongoCube, which has been a lot oh, around, I think, a little bit while, a little while, as far as I can tell, right there, uh, like GitHub and stuff is pretty new though. But yeah, MongoCube is another one. That okay. Yeah, yeah anyway. I, I found out one <laughs> yesterday, which I didn't put in our notes. Dragonfly. Again, it's a sandbox project uh, for CNCF. Uh, again, I couldn't dis- do justice in the description, but it had to do something around, like if you're downloading a lot of data for AI models, it helps you. It, it's like a bit torrent, but for Kubernetes uh, and, and your AI data sets. So that's a cool project too. Maybe we can do some more research and, and come back as with it as a news section. Yeah, maybe uh, we need to uh, uh, have a refresher on all the uh, the data uh, services yeah. types, operators, and stuff. 
been a and while I, since we did an episode on that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay. Next up, I think uh, I have a couple of funding rounds. Uh, so before we jump into the funding rounds, right? Actually, uh, we works like they decided I to close know, its doors. I know. Like I know it, that was a sad moment for me. I was like. We, there was so much good content when I was ramping up in the Kubernetes ecosystem from VWorks using tools like EKS, CTL, all the work that they did around GitOps. Thank you so much. Like you were a great yeah. part of the community. We'll definitely Thank you to the you. WeWorks folks. Um, yeah. I know that one of the first times I met some of those um, uh, folks over at WeWorks was like in DockerCon in Spain or something like uh-huh. way, way back. Uh, Cause they've been around for a very long yeah, time doing uh, yeah. so many different things. Right. So yeah, it really has been a pleasure and hopefully we'll see all of them end up somewhere new and interesting. Yep. Okay. Now going back to funding rounds, like good news. So Zedira, a <laughs> uh, startup in the Kubernetes edge ecosystem, right? They raised uh, $72 million in a oversubscribed CDC round. Uh, and that brings their total capital raised to $127 million. Uh, I think the reason they're getting a lot of money is they're showing an incredible growth in their ARR. So they saw like a 250% increase in their ARR from last year and more than 300% of nodes under management. So like the number of nodes under management grew by more than 300%. So definitely uh, they seem to have found a product market fit and now they're just going to use this money to to scale and to grow. I know one of our previous Portworks uh, sales, uh, VP of sales, yeah. Steve Ackley is now. So hard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's at Zadira now, so I'm sure like they're just scaling yeah, all of this. Uh, but yeah, that, that's... Revenue, you know, something that uh, investors really like to see. No yeah. surprise there, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. And they're solving an interesting use case, right? Like managing these thousands of clusters and or tens of yeah. thousands of clusters at scale is difficult. And if somebody can help you do that, you know, people will pay them money. So uh, that's, a, that's a good company to know of. And then finally, we uh, a really small startup that just emerged from Stealth and announced like $5 million in seed funding. I think it's based out of Israel. Uh, they are another vendor in the Kubernetes security ecosystem. Looking at their website, like it was difficult to find out what's unique with them. But again, that's true for any seed company, right? They're trying to find the product market fit. They're trying to, I don't know, spread out their eggs and see what works, where they can find their unique differentiation by the time Series A or Series B comes around. Uh, but an interesting term I learned on their website was continuous threat exposure management, CTAM. I don't know if that's a word, but uh, that that's what they claim that they do. Like they continuously uh, manage threats in your environment. So it would be good to keep an eye out on Ktrust and see if like they have a booth at KubeCon Europe in Paris next month or or in, in Salt Lake City in November and learn more about them. But yeah, just wanted to share those. Uh, and that's it for news for me. Back from uh, Bobbin's Fundings Corner. We gotta create some kind of like a uh, partial episode. Uh, yeah, yeah, that <laughs> like can be a good idea for like it. a short. Yeah, a YouTube <laughs> short or something that people can yeah. do. I like that, dude. Hey, if if you're listening and you'd like just funding round shorts, hit yeah. us up and we'll, we'll see. We'll see if we can do because <laughs> Bobbin's are pretty good at uh, that. <laughs> cool. Uh, so the first article I have here is not. Um, news per se but it is relevant to today's episode it's an it's an article um on on the news stack really uh titled kubernetes predictions were wrong so it's you know it's intriguing for me um basically the the thought process is in 2020 the article kind of tells you um that people thought kubernetes might disappear something would come along as sort of an easy default yeah. um so to speak and this really just plays into the complexity that is Kubernetes, right? Um, you know, early on, I remember a lot of the community pitching, let's keep Kubernetes boring, right? Yeah. Let's, let's keep that. And um, as we've seen, the the industry as a whole has continued to add, 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 add to Kubernetes. And, mm-hmm. you know, the fear, I think, you know, there might be even an episode that we, we talk about this of like, everything that happened with OpenStack where it just got so large and so yeah. complex um, that, you know, it needed something else. So, right. So anyway, this article is a pretty good article that kind of goes into the, the cognitive load, which, you know, we'll talk a little bit about today in our topic. Mm-hmm. Um, and anyway, super relevant and a real problem. I think when you're, especially if you're thinking about adopting Kubernetes, cause it can be, um, a lot of decisions yeah. <laughs> for quite quite some time. So uh, thinking about how you can get started faster is definitely something to uh, dig into. Um, the And that article was uh, from Steve Fenton, an Octonaut uh, 
At, Octonaut. Uh, Octonaut nice. is actually a show my daughter watches. Oh, is half. it like a cartoon <laughs> thing? Or? He's at Octopus Deploy. Uh, uh, I guess that's a company. But anyway, I digress for, <laughs> for those listening with kids. Maybe you know the show Octonauts, but we'll see. Um, uh, the second article was about Crossplane's 115 release. Um, so one of the things nice. <clears throat> that I we've had Crossplane on the show with uh, mm-hmm. Victor. Um, one of the things I liked about this release is we talked about com- uh, composition functions, right? Uh, yeah. Being able to kind of use programming languages, SDKs. Um, they started to support uh, Python, right? So I think uh, that's a significant uh, addition just because of how popular that uh programming language is um i think go is the other one they support i forget if not but anyway python seems to be um blowing up even more with all the ai focus a lot of people are using python as well so uh, go check a look go check out that 115 release from uh crossplane and that's all the news i had to bring to the table today (laughs) bobby (laughs) <laughs> okay, let's, let's talk about what we have for the episode. This episode is brought to you by our friends from Elotil. Elotil Luna is an intelligent Kubernetes cluster autoscaler that provisions just-in-time, right-sized, and cost-effective compute for your Kubernetes apps. The compute is scaled both up and down as your workloads demand change, thereby reducing operational complexity and preventing wasted spend. Luna is ideally suited for dynamic and bursty workloads such as dev test workloads, machine learning jobs, stream processing workloads, as well as workloads that need special resources such as GPUs or ARM-based instances. Luna is generally available on Amazon EKS, Google Cloud GKE, Azure AKS, and Oracle OKE. Learn more about Luna at elotil.co slash Luna and download their free trial at elotil.co slash Luna dash free dash trial. Introducing our guests, Ryan and Bobbin. <laughs> nice to see you again. Nice. Uh, <laughs> I see you in one of the first uh, original one on uh, like just the two of us episodes that we did, you had like, oh, I hear they are awesome people. I like, oh, yeah. I did, yeah. <laughs> in our notes, I heard they're great. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What can I say? Got to got to boost my confidence in some nice. way. Keep working. Um, all right. So today's topic, Bobbin, is IDPs, pretty much, right? Yeah. So we'll give it a different title, of course. That's a little more catchy for the uh, interwebs. But uh, we're going to be talking about internal development platforms, not mm-hmm. um, identity providers. That is, that oh, is nice. one thing that if you're Googling IDPs, just know that there's two things that are very popular right now called IDP, and they just have slightly different annotations in terms of like uh, identity providers, a capital I, lowercase d, capital P, and I, internal development platform, as I've seen, um, is all capitals, IDP, but really. I never knew that difference. Like I never uh, realized that there was a different way to spell this. Okay, okay, that's good. So now you know. Um, <laughs> Anyway, because you'll find like if you're searching just the term rather than you just yeah. just Google internal developer Developer. platform yep. <laughs> just from the start and you'll be less confused. But <clears throat> we're here to talk about sort of the the what is it? Why <laughs> do we care about it? Um, yeah. And this differs a little bit from our platform engineering episodes in the sense that we're really going to focus in on what is the IDP, mm-hmm. what benefits, pros and cons you get out of it being uh, different kind of people within the company and um, some of the companies that we kind of have seen in this space that are, you know, doing really well or open source or whatever. We'll cover those at the yeah. end, um, but hopefully it'll give you a bit of a landscape of, of what this is. So where, where do we start? Let's start okay. with what an, uh, what is an IDP and, and maybe how it differs from platform engineering. Okay. Uh, okay. I think uh, this is just my perspective, right? Like uh, platform engineering is like the whole, um, buzzword or the high level term that describes uh, that gives IT teams or, or DevOps teams a, a dedicated budget to improve the developer productivity. And I think IDPs are a way how they can increase their developer productivity. So like IDP is about having a, a platform internally to make sure your developers are not waiting on resources or they're being as productive as it can. Or if there is a failure event, they're able to identify those things uh, uh, quickly and then fix them so the mean time to recover and mean time between failures all those metrics that developers might be tracking 
uh, are within within their service level objective. So I think that's that's for me. Uh, before before Ryan, you go. I, I, like yesterday, Kelsey uh, tweeted something around platform engineering. I just I did see that. Share. Yeah, yeah. yeah I like platform that. engineering is like going to the gym. Like signing up is easy, but you have to actually put in the work. So I think today is when we'll <laughs> talk about like putting in the work. How people yeah. can build those IDPs. <laughs> That's a great segue. I did see that um, either this morning or yesterday. Yeah. And I, I, I could really appreciate it. Um, I think he had something else to say. Uh, well, there was a lot of conversation about you yeah. could you could just replace the platform engineering part of it, right, with a lot of other things. Just the yeah. term engineering. Engineering is like a gym. It's easy to sign up. You actually put the work in. So, it, you know, um, it, it is a broad statement, but he's not wrong. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's a good po- uh, point to to say. Um, and I think it kind of lines up with the way I think about it is mm-hmm. platform engineering is the practice. Yep. Right. It's the practice. It's the culture. It's the kind of the thought process and strategy. Whereas IDPs is is uh, a set of tools that make up a platform to, to help you in that practice, right? It's yeah. kind of the way I look at it is sort of um, an IDP is part of your platform engineering strategy or practice. So yep. um, whereas you could both say that an IDP and platform engineering are trying to improve the developer experience um, and and kind of use DevOps tools and kind of uh, DevOps learnings uh, to kind of increase productivity and those kind of things. It is kind of a subset. So yeah, we're going to focus on the subset uh, of of specifically kind of what's in the IDP. And um, speaking of platform engineering, I did uh, jump on the uh, .org site. Mm-hmm. And they had a, a pretty interesting viewpoint of a definition. So in quotes yeah. here, it's an internal development platform is a set of tools and services and processes that support and accelerate your software development while taking care of the underlying infrastructure. Yeah. So there's a couple key points that I like out of this. Some that I, I don't love, but it's okay, right? The um, the the set of tools, right, is a big one, right? It is mm-hmm. a set of tools. It's not always the same set of tools, yep. but essentially you package up all those sets of tools and it becomes sort of your platform, right? Obviously you have to present it to uh, the end user in some fashion. The other part of this that I like is, right, accelerate your software development. I think accelerates overused, Right, <laughs> it, it, like just an in term, but yeah. I think another way I like um, that I've seen this talked about in this space is reducing cognitive load. Right. Yep. Um, that's a like a term that is associated with IDPs and platform engineering. Is we're seeing that s- Kubernetes and developing software is more and more complex every day. And, and when we when we added uh, Kubernetes and, and all these tools to the table, right, it's a lot for a single development team mm-hmm. or individual to really process and think about. So they don't necessarily need to know the nuts and bolts, how the thing exactly is, is deployed or yeah. what which tools to you know download and versions and whether they're patched, all this stuff, right? So there's a lot going on. So cognitive load reducing, and I like that term because it really kind of flows with why am I doing it? Why do I need an idea? Yep. Right. No, I think it, it. I know we said accelerate is a is a really highly used word, but yeah. uh, I think it makes sense, right? Like we have yeah. all been in scenarios or heard stories about developers having to wait weeks or days to get access to environments. I had a friend back in like I still have that friend, but back in 2014. <laughs> I like how you clarify. I had it yeah. because of this, you know. <laughs> back in 2014, when he used to work for like a healthcare company. Uh, a couple of he, he like I met him after like on a Wednesday and I was like, what did you do this week? It's like nothing. I'm just waiting for my <laughs> IT admin to give me access to a Windows VM so I can test my code. I was like, how is like, why, why are you not fixing things on your own? So like you, you don't want people in those scenarios, right? You don't want developers just sitting around for resources that's and we really want, that's where the accelerate term comes in. Like, let, let's make sure they're not blocked. They're not, I, I don't know if you have seen the XKCD meme, like a, Oh yeah, uh, developers are fi- fighting using swords uh, on chairs <laughs> outside because their code is compiling. I think let's make sure that they're not fighting using swords because they're looking <laughs> for infrastructure resources. You, you know, like it's, it's a valid point. I, the yeah. thing I think I don't like about accelerate in this sense is that you can still have something be super complex and do it yeah. fast. Yeah, that's true. Right. It just it means that the team is probably under undue stress or working long hours, right? They can accelerate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess that's where I, I'm like, all right, I like the other term. But yeah, totally fair, okay. right? I think ultimately is you're pushing software 
you're releasing software faster, right? Something yeah. that we've heard in a lot of other practice, like DevOps principles in general, right? Same yep. same process, or even if you're going further back in other principles. So, so anyway, right, like they share since we're talking about IDPs, right? What do you feel like are the critical <laughs> aspects? Like what what's a what's the best IDP? Like how can I build the best IDP? Yeah, well, first, don't if you don't have to. <laughs> 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 is, is my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, the build versus buy, we can kind of mm -hmm. cover that a bit later. But I think with, you know, where the market is today and, and kind of if you're using Kubernetes, um, the buy is very enticing, right? Mm -hmm. And I do have an example. There was a great talk by um, some folks at, um, which company was this that I was going for? Uh, I'll, I'll bring it up later. But okay. um, basically, it's a talk that talked about their whole journey with creating uh, their IDP. And it was like this eight year journey, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, over time. And some of the tools didn't even exist when they started creating yeah. this journey. So, uh, anyway, we'll cover that a little bit later. But going back to your question, you know, I think a big part of A, what I hear in the, in, the greater community and be what I believe is having that self-service aspect, mm -hmm. right? So whatever this platform does, whatever you build it to do or buy it to do, um, you need to definitely enable the developers to be able to consume it, use it in a very self-service manner, meaning mm -hmm. that um, you don't want a few to get in the way of many, right? This one, yeah. uh, that's one kind of quote that I've seen in the sense that, your example before is like, I'm waiting on this ticket. Yeah. <laughs> right. You have a, probably a few people in IT responsible and uh, for this thing, and he's w waiting on, on, on a team. So this platform needs to enable um, <clears throat> self-service in a way, and that could be APIs. It could be button clicks. It could be whatever, uh, whatever that means it differs yep. depending on which platform you're using, but really enabling either the, the application team or the developer to kind of go in there and still have some bit of flexibility, right. To say, um, I can pick and choose the pieces I want or how this is actually going to work within some yep. guardrails and, and the guardrails kind of touches on another topic, right. Uh, which is sort of the, the second one. And I would say one of the most critical to an IDP is, the the guardrails represent sort of standardization or yep. um you know i think the term we've heard in the platform engineering space is the golden path right yeah a golden path gives you a way to get to production with a predefined set of ways to do things and, and predefined set of tools and configurations uh to make it easier for you now uh that standardization does come with some i guess cons in terms of like having full freedom Yep. But in order to have an IDP really help your organization, right? If the, if the end goal for your business is um, to accelerate your software releases, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, kind of as a as a developer, being able to standardize should be something you're willing to do. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that's harder to convince teams that have been doing certain things a certain way for a long time. That's I think that's the trade off. Is like you 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 all have to buy into this uh, culture. Right. Yep. Of I'm willing to to use these golden paths. Now, of course, there still has to be that aspects of freedom, meaning like, OK, the platform can give you a golden path to production, but maybe a few ways to do it. Right. So yep. it gives you a data, a few data services you can you can choose from or, you know, a way to kind of do your CI and CD or a way to do testing or that kind of thing or a way to deploy your application. What does that look like? Does it give you scaffolding? Right. Yep. Scaffolding is just an a a loose opinion versus you must only put your image name or something in here yeah. right i don't know how you feel about no that. I, I think that makes sense right and i want to take it to a, to a different persona as well like i know platform engineering is more focused towards platform engineers and it operations who are building these golden parts but I think it has to be a shared responsibility models. The developers, if they find out that the golden parts that are already paid for them are maybe used in, let's say, 50% of the scenario, but then for everything else, they find new trends or new tools that they end up using in the freedom aspect or, or yeah. the loosely, loose, uh, loosely held scaffolding aspect, they should bring that feedback in, right? It has to be an iterative process. Like if you find, if you find that the golden parts are not enough, just make sure that you're working with the platform team and making sure that those get added over the next month, next quarter, so that it, it, you are improving it incrementally and then you're reaching towards an end goal. Uh, so it has to be iterative. So it has to be a shared respons uh, responsibility for me. Yeah, and that brings up a good point. One I didn't originally have, I might have had it somewhere else in here. Yeah. But if you're the 
team building this platform, mm -hmm. developers or application teams, those should be the, the, your, your most highly valued input. Yeah. Right. Because at the end of the day, um, yeah, it customers. This, yeah. yeah, they're your yeah. customers. And um, if you boil the ocean and create this platform and say all of a sudden they have to do things a certain way, you're probably not going to get people to be super excited about that. Yeah. Um, but if you were to just go to your developers and say, let's sit down, and have a conversation. Tell me where your biggest pain points are, where yep. what gets you most frustrated in your daily work. Yeah. Right. And then as a platform sort of mindset, you can say, all right, let me help you solve that and figure out how we can boil that into that golden path. Right. Yep. Um, so kind of paving one, one way. Um, I think I had <clears throat> this analogy that I really liked. I wrote down from uh, Microsoft, their platform oh. engineering space, which is, um, oh, wait. Yeah. yeah. So um, it says IDPs are often a loose scaffolding of practices and they um, associated it with, oh, wait, is it from the Microsoft people? I may be totally wrong on this, <laughs> but it's, it's in here either way. Um, uh, but that loose scaffolding represents sort of a trail. Yeah. Right. So a loosely, you know, there's rocks all over the place. It's made of dirt and you're kind of, it's hard to get through there, but there's still a path to where you want to go. Yep. Right. So you start in a way of, of that loose scaffolding of practices gives you that trail to where you want to go. Over time, your platform becomes uh, well oiled and like a paved highway. Yep. Right. So you, you learn all the best practices and how, how the platform best fits your, um, your teams. And that then eventually becomes that paved highway. And, um, it's sort of like if you have like a, an orthotic fit to your exact foot, right. A platform engineering isn't a one size fits all. Yeah. I'm just throwing analogies out over and over nice. again. <laughs> <laughs> Keep them coming. <laughs> anyway. So yeah, anyway, your, your best input comes from your, your customers and it's, you know, you can't buy <clears throat> going back to that buy versus yeah. uh, build is you can't, even if you buy something, you still have to adopt it for yep. uh, and customize it or make sure you have that option. In my opinion, I don't think there's just like a drop and go type of situation. No, agreed, right? And it, the drop and go might work for early stage companies or early organizations that are really early in this journey because that gives them like a great way to experiment and, and adopt the, the, the uh, concept of platform engineering. But then maybe after six months, they will have to customize it to fit their use case better. So I think it might help you get started and give you that head start if you're buying that and then you can customize it down the line. So uh, it definitely has to be a decision internally. Absolutely. And I, I so I was talking with, hopefully someone will have on the show, the founder of Atomi. Yeah. Um, and one of his things were, you know, if if the devs, if we're so focused on the engineers and the devs and they're all kind of like fighting over which tooling to use. Yeah. We're, we're doing it wrong, right? Yeah. Um, you know, adopting an IDP means you you kind of buy into that culture and mm -hmm. the, the the company goal or the wider yeah. goal of like producing that thing. So anyway, we'll have hopefully more conversations with him in the future uh, around this topic as well. So gotcha. uh, the last couple on my list were automation, right? So this was sort of mentioned in the .org um, uh, definition. There has to be a level of automation, right? So that your cognitive load is reduced because you don't want to have to think about also writing your own infrastructure um, code, right? Or, or Terraform or something like that yeah. to deploy and manage these things. Hopefully your platform builds in the concept of, you know, here's where things deploy, either has it sort of environments for you or can provision those for mm -hmm. you. Now, like how that actually works is really dependent on your team and use cases. Um, and, and lastly, sort of the feedback or the monitoring, right? The, how much does this thing cost? Um, yeah. Is it compliant? Uh, where, what are my logs and where are they? What are my traces? What's the performance? All that feedback should be available yep. um, again to, as a self-service way back to you. So you can, you can say, oh, well, is my, is it performing? Right. Yes. There's probably like SRE teams and mm -hmm. platform people monitoring these kind of things and alerts happening, but it should also be available to you. Yeah. And I think one of like, when we had the discussion with New York times, right. One of the things that I Ahmed brought up was it's okay if you don't have a perfectly automated end to end workflow, right. It's okay to have those duct tapes and glues in between where, oh, sure. please run this sure. custom script to fetch yeah. some things and then feed it into the, so that's still okay. Like it, it, as we said, right, it's going to be an iterative process. Yeah. You're going to continuously improve it. So have the aim of automating the entire thing, but if it's not automated right now, don't worry about holding it back for the next six months and not allowing developers to use it. Just like 
Yeah. Let it out in the wild inside your organization and, and see how you can improve it together, right? So that shared responsibility, I think. Absolutely, right. Um, I don't think you can go into any shop and it be perfect welds and shiny. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I think at that point, they should just switch their focus from selling whatever they are to selling like an IDB <laughs> for that works. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's always going to be, you know, duct tape and glue, as you put it. Yep. Um, JB Weld, as I like to, to say. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're just throwing these analogies all over. Sorry if you hate analogies, yeah. right? We're really going heavy this time. And also, these are all mostly are just our opinions yeah. um, and and from who we talk to and stuff like that. So, but yeah, I, I think I, I want to also add the fact that like platform engineering is not a new thing, right? We have been like e- even Kubernetes Bytes has been talking it for a term. couple of years. Yeah, uh, but I've seen it evolve, right? It's not a static thing where in, when it started, it was like. I've seen demos where, oh, you want an object storage bucket, you you can go to your IDP and just tell it which cloud you want that object storage bucket in. And on the back end, the IDP has the intelligence to either configure an S3 or an Azure Blob or a Google Cloud object storage bucket and give you an endpoint that you can use. That's that's great, right? Like if you if you can automate the all the provisioning operations, that's perfect. But what yeah. I've seen as an evolution, and these are some of the vendors that we'll talk about or tools that we'll talk about, is it's giving platform engineering and IDPs are trying to give developers a single pane of glass or a, uh, an operation center kind of a view, right? Like some of the demos that you see of the vendors that we'll have on our list, you'll see that. Uh, developers can log in in the morning. They can figure out what, uh, like the, for the services that they are responsible for, what are their SLAs? Did they go down? They can start the troubleshooting exercises right from the dashboard, connect to the relevant Slack channels. Like it is becoming that, right? It's not just yeah. about provisioning. It's about how developers do work. I think yeah. if you can figure that out as an organization, it will be a really easy experience and developers would want to come and work for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we'll get into the difference too. And some of the IDPs will mention is like yeah. some of them go to that length, yep. right? Pro- provide the documentation integration, the messaging, all that. Some of them don't. Some of them yep. focus on sort of the infrastructure and application automation. So yep. depends on really what you're looking for, probably how large your team is, yep. all that kind of stuff. Um, I, you know, there's probably people out there. You know, if we haven't lost them already, thinking you know another conversation on APs and platform engineering, uh, and you and you might and there's there's a valid point to that, right? Mm-hmm. Where we've often talked about how, in many ways, people have been doing a lot of the stuff within platform engineering, and now we're calling it that. So yeah. I, I I like to you know, and I worked for a company where we did the equivalent of what we talk about today in yep. 2016, right? And that yeah. wasn't a term yet, but we were building a platform. Um, the point being is that I think the term and why we're talking about it now is because we've we reached a, an apex in in complexity where we needed something as a community to yeah. represent a better future. You yep. know, if to really to really pull out and and kind of uh, look at it from a high level, I think that's more of what it represents. It's like, hey, we 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 know there's a better way and a more efficient way to do this for our for our customers internally. What do, what do we want to call it, and how do we like yeah. you know gather behind it? Let's move on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pros and cons. Should we yeah, do some pros and cons? Let's do pros and cons for sure. Um, so I'm going to start with sort of like governance, right? Mm-hmm. Which is, it seems like such a, like it feels dirty when you say governance, right? Cause yeah. no one wants to really do it. Or if you're a developer, you're like, Oh, great governance. Um, but the, as a company adopting IDPs, right. You're, you're managing risk, right? Ultimately mm-hmm. by using a set of best practices, uh, and forming some standardization in your IDP, forming those golden paths, you kind of have a, a better sense of, 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 how things look, what to expect that makes things more compliant. If you mm-hmm. can kind of build other, you know, uh, forms of checks and balances into those golden paths. Uh, it's, it's also becomes more auditable, right. In yep. the sense that if you know, if you don't have a bunch of skunk works teams doing whatever they want, um, that's very unauditable, right. On the mm-hmm. other side of the spectrum. And so, and you can generally monitor and, and manage those, those things. So like governance as a whole, I think really, can help streamline right, yep. the 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 whole process. That's definitely one of the big ones. Would you gotcha. agree? Yeah, I do, right? And I think it it reduces the effort that the the developer has to go through. Like, I'm I'm not a, honestly. If I start writing code again, 
which I haven't in, in a while. But if I start <laughs> writing code to? for a product, I might, I don't know how to manage my secrets or encrypt my things. Like if, if there are these best practices that an expert inside my organization has figured out that are readily available for me to use, I'll use that instead of just storing my unencrypted username and password as secrets or by mistake pushing them to my Git repository. So if, if you have those guardrails around me, those governance best practices, I think that will help me and, and help the organization make it more secure. And yeah. Yeah. And I've, there's probably a lot of folks that probably fall into that category, but yeah. there's probably a lot who don't, but again, again, built like buying into that culture, drinking yeah. a bit of the Kool-Aid, I guess, so to speak, yeah. that makes it sound bad. But um anyway, yeah, the I you mentioned writing code and I my my brain shot off to another direction. Uh, also speaking about Kelsey Hightower's Twitter, he yeah. said that the his no code uh um repository turned six. Uh-huh. Oh, really? Which is if you haven't gone to it, Kelsey Hightower slash no code on github.com, it it's hilarious, right? It's like okay. so no code is the title. No code is the best way to write secure and reliable applications, writing nothing, deploy nowhere. <laughs> getting started. Okay, I didn't know that. Not, getting started, start by not writing any code. Oh. <laughs> this is just an example a- application, but imagine it doing anything you want. <laughs> anyway, please go do it. It's, it's quite hilarious. And uh, yeah, six, six years ago, you put that up there. Okay. And yeah, anyway, uh, pretty funny. Uh, Circling back to our pros and cons, um, another uh, pro, which kind of goes along the lines of the governance is security, mm-hmm. right? So when you have uh, an IDP, there's, you can kind of preset some, um, some tools within that platform uh, that are built in, right? You can yeah. do things like shift some of the security left towards your developers in the sense that when they're kicking off or, you know, when they're contributing to a repo, automated builds start happening, automated tests start happening. And part of those automation um, pipelines, you can have security, uh, image scanning, CV scanning, all those things, right? And kind of present that in a way back to the development team and say, well, like, you know, you're out of compliance, you know, going yeah. back to the governance thing. Um, have that all built in uh, to, to really help. Uh, on the other side of it, right, that's shifting sort of towards the developer. On the other side of it, if you're automating infrastructure and I don't know why I said it that way, infrastructure. Um, <laughs> if you're automating infrastructure and things like that, you can build in best practices uh, yeah. security-wise if that's in cloud or on-prem, those kind of things. Gotcha. No, I th- I agree, right? Like security it, it, it is definitely the key. Uh, yeah, we have heard incidents. Especially these days. Yeah. I, yeah. I read, um, I think it was a post or a Twitter post. Uh, or LinkedIn or Twitter, where someone was kind of griping about how as an industry, we, and sorry, because I don't remember your name, but I'll quote you, yeah. <laughs> whoever you are, um, is uh, the industry has gotten really slack on providing uh, security by default examples, right? Mm-hmm. So the the thing, I think the quote was, I can go to any product page or, or repo and and do things like spin up 30 Kubernetes clusters in 30 seconds. Yeah. But if I want a secure production environment, it's going to take me nine months, right? Is, like yeah. a, is the general synopsis. And and like there's a million hello world examples that aren't realistic, right? <laughs> and we don't go be in a lot of them don't go beyond like here's how you do like how many how many examples do you see of like, oh, just you know, turn this security feature off. <laughs> or, you I know, know let's make it work for the demo. <laughs> yeah, make, exactly. it, so, make a cool demo. I think some of the blame is for us as well. Yeah. <laughs> there's something to be said about that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not saying I'm not guilty of doing exactly yeah. that. I, Same. I very yeah. much am. So um but it uh, it's a good point. And I always like someone who has <laughs> the, those opinions. Um cool. So moving on, alignment, right? So yeah. this is more general term, but when you have an IDP, you have multiple developer teams. Uh, using hopefully some of those paths in that IDP. And so uh, multiple teams can collaborate a little easier, ideally. Like Bhavan, you were saying before, sometimes documentation and and Mm -hmm. messaging and those kind of things are built in. So you can kind of all kind of work off the same platform. Um, But, you know, it doesn't mean every team is going to uh, it doesn't mean every team is going to use exactly the same path through that IP. And that is okay. I think, um, yeah, the, the talk I was referencing before is by Mercado Libre, um, Mm -hmm. Marcelo and Giuliano at 
dash conf, I believe. Okay. Anyway, um, this is their sort of IDP building, building an IDP, right? Concept. And at the end of it, eight years into it, eight years into a, um, a really well thought out IDP, they still said 20% of applications don't use our IDP. And they go, okay. that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Right. Sure. Um, you know, to a certain extent, you might think, well, wow, that's a lot of effort for still mm-hmm. having just 80%, but I would say 80%, especially at a company that large, right? Which yeah. um, I wasn't familiar with them until I put, you know, watched the talk and we'll put the link of the talk in there. But that's a just an example of the fact that IDPs don't don't have to be the be all end all, right? Yeah. There's there's some things that are probably going to live without live outside of that golden path or IDP in general. Don't worry about uh, creating a golden path for deploying things to your mainframe. Is that what you're saying? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want to go there, uh, do that. <laughs> so be it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, essentially, that's kind of the idea. Or you know, or that's just your your tool chain doesn't have whatever that application is kind of focused on. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. So, um, okay, alignment. Really getting all your devs kind of working in a similar way. Um, and alignment for, I, I would say, the executives to kind of have a better sense of how things are going, uh, which leads into sort of a business pro, uh, which is, I like this, I didn't, I came across this term, TTBV. It's actually quite fun to say, but time to business value. I Yeah, I know, there's so, so many acronyms, but I had to put it in there because it flew off the tongue nice. really well. Uh, time to business value, right, this is just that acceleration piece. Yeah. Right. You can ideally, if you do an IDP correctly and people buy into it as a culture, as a tool chain, you'll be able to uh, release things faster. So therefore, your developers can focus on writing business value applications and putting, pushing them out and not waiting a week for their uh, VM to test something. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think, uh, and like, again, I love the term TTBV, but I am See, just glad. Even, it's, it's fun to say, right? <laughs> At this point, I'm just glad that uh, platform engineering and IDPs didn't end up being like one of those zero interest rate phenomena, right? Where it was a, a hobby project or it was a project in, in, that was funded internally because you can, yeah. you can hire 10 more people to do something. Uh, yeah, that's fair. Uh, it, it, it may it make should. sense to still do it that way. Yeah. So like yeah. it started, maybe it started with that, right? Like, oh, we have some extra money. Let's see if we can implement this new thing and see if it works out. Not a new thing, but like a new concept and see if it works out. And I think there are many organizations that have seen real value. Uh, so that's why execs are buying in. Like if, if you didn't see any real value, that's the first project to go out, right? So I think the platform engineering does bring real business value to organization. It might not generate revenue for you, but it definitely helps you save on operational costs. And your CEO can go on your quarterly earnings report and say that we saved on operational costs. So yeah. that, that will always boost the stock price up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you you got to think ahead, really. Yeah. <laughs> you, you gotta, how do you please the, the people up top is at the I end know. of the day. Uh, <laughs> we're, all, we're all just treading water, right? No, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, and, and the last one, which I've mentioned before is, uh, reducing that cognitive load. Um, I think might be one of the bigger pros from the user perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, if you are willing to buy into that, right. There's probably power users out there who are like, I want to use whatever I want to use to do the job the best. And so be it. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, (laughs) Um, And maybe you can convince the platform team to let you do that that way. Um, so the biggest con kind of going along these lines is rigidity, right? It could be too rigid, um, too opinionated, not flexible enough. Now, I would say there's a way to go about this, right? Um, you shouldn't develop the IDP where developers must do things in mm-hmm. a very specific way, give them multiple options to do the, the accomplish the yeah. goal to use that path, give them multiple tools. Um, this is my opinion, but to kind of help with that and start yep. small, right? Yep. Um, the Mercado Libre uh, talk, which I really, really liked. That's why I keep mentioning it. They, they framed it really well early on, which is again, going back to talk to your developers, find out their pain points, start with something small, like, I don't know, it could be, it's really hard to register DNS or something or do discard, like whatever it may be, solve that small problem yeah. again. And they built their own. So they took all those learnings and said, mm-hmm. how do we p- put this in our platform? Whereas if you're buying, you might have to look at which aligns best with, yep. you know, your end user pain points, but 
that being said, it can be too rigid, especially if you buy and drop and say, well, I know you've been developing a certain way, but do it this way now, right? With these tools. Uh, but no, I think the, the buy-in aspect is great, right? And I want to give like Tim, who's my current manager, some credit. Like he Dude. uses this Japanese term called Nima Washi, where it's yes. about uh, trying to uh, like it's it's not really going after like meetings before meetings and meetings after meetings, but it's making sure that everybody is in the loop, everybody is aware of what's going on. Nimawashi is a concept I think where in Japan where they wanted to move certain types of plants from one terrain to another. They they started with smaller sap, uh, saplings and made sure that they can survive and thrive, and that's when they moved over like trees or something. So again, I'm butchering what Nimawashi means, but it helps. I'll help, <laughs> I just you, wanted- I'll help you. It's a um a building a consensus using a one-on-one discussion with each member of a decision-making group. Perfect. In other ways, yeah. informally and quietly laying the foundation to a proposed change. How yeah. do you do? Yeah, that, that's great. Right? Well, you should like, say, I how think... did Google do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, not chat GPT. Come on, Ryan. I know. Well, I didn't have it up. <laughs> no, I think uh, that is important, right? Like it can be too rigid if you don't gather feedback, if you don't involve people, but if you are going and working with everybody, you will end up being making up a, a product or an IDP that, that that's more usable. I think I, I like to share this, these stats from Spotify, like they, they shared something in 2023 where their internal backstage based IDP, right? They were the founders for backstage project. They have 96% utilization. Like, dude, that's a lot. Like yeah. Spotify has a lot of developers. And if 96% of them are using your IDP, that's a win. That's I'll call that a win for that's sure. A big win, I would yeah. say. Yeah. yeah, no, I like Nimawashi. Shout out, Tim. Missing yeah. you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's a great way because if you don't do it in a in that way, or right, you don't develop that trust, yeah. you become an enemy and and uh to a certain extent. And Honestly, that is, you've kind of failed from the get go if you do it that way. And the, if the people who you need to um, buy in the most and develop the best relationship with, uh, if you just say, you know, if you become an enemy too early on, I would say it's a recipe for failure. So yeah, and even wash it up. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, go talk to your, your stakeholders and be nice to them. <laughs> okay. So, Ryan, I know you have been doing a lot of research around the different open source and, and vendor projects. Do you want to share some some of those names and people, the things that people can look into? Yeah, yeah, sure. Absolutely. So um, there's a lot of projects in this space uh, and, and I'll kind of list a bunch and we'll kind of dive into a couple. Mm-hmm. Um, some big ones and some more, I should say, popular ones, not necessarily big is a bad term, but more yeah. popular ones. Cortex is really doing a, little, a lot of awesome stuff. Stuff. Um, ops level. Uh, we've talked to Argonaut. Uh, I would yep. say fits into this uh, this space as well. Uh, again, these all differ a little bit, and, and we can talk a little bit about what that is. Upbound, NetHopper. Um, I recently talked with the Atomi uh, mm-hmm. folks, which is by Red Cubes. Uh, they're up to some really cool stuff. Backstage slash uh, Rody. Rody's you know the kind of the enterprise version, but um, Backstage. I think probably a lot of people might recognize that yeah. name. Um, there's some other ones that I, I looked into as well that I wasn't as familiar with, like Amazy, Configurate, um, uh, Kubernetes, which I've heard of, yeah. uh, Dutch Lagoon, Gardner, Portainer. So there's, and, and again, these all, they all don't fit into necessarily the, uh, the mold of it's an IDP that we just discussed and has all those things. Mm-hmm. Some of them have some of what we talked about. Some of them have a few things that we talked about. Some yeah. have a lot of it and more probably. So um, I don't know. Where Do you want to dig in anywhere? Did you look at yeah, it? No, I, I think uh, I just want to highlight Cortex, right? Because uh, looking at your list, I was like, let me look into a couple of these guys. And I remember talking to them at KubeCon uh, Chicago and uh, watching a demo at their booth. I like how that's why I, I like the transformation around platform engineering, right? They're not, they're more than just a service provisioner. They are, they want to be the system of record for engineering teams. And this is just pulling a statement from their website. So I uh, don't want to market any products, but that's, <laughs> I, I like that term. <laughs> but it is that single pane of glass, that operation center. Like as a developer in the morning, I can wake up, see what issues, bugs. I can uh, go and talk in the right or ask questions or collaborate in the right Slack channels, find the right docs. 
it, they also show you who's on call and who's available. So if a service goes down, right. you get a notification, you know who's on call. And it, it is that more collaborative approach of doing things. Ryan, yeah. you and I have used Slack internally when you, we used to work together. There are so many different Slack channels where you might have repetitive discussions or duplicate di- discussions in different Slack right. channels and it's difficult to f- get everybody in the same on the same page. So having tools like Cortex, which is that single source of truth or system of record, I think helps. So I really like their approach. And if, if this is where everybody is going, I, in, in not just being a service provisioner, but adding more uh, value, I think I like that, right? Like uh, as a developer, it just makes people's lives easier. Yeah. Uh, and and that's that's a good point. We didn't really talk about, you know, we talked about messaging and, yeah. and, and documentation, but we didn't really talk about integrating on-call schedules. Yeah. Um, but again, it's how people work and, and developers, DevOps engineers, whatever you, they're probably part of that on-call schedule. Um, yep. Migration's another one that I know Cortex does. Like, how do you uh, onboard something to uh, your IDP, right? It, uh, not every IDP is going to offer an easy way to do that. Um, so getting applications kind of to use the technologies that your IDP uh, allows you to, to uh, deploy to, et cetera. So yeah, definitely one of the more, um, I think, uh, fully featured, wider mm-hmm. spread, bigger products out there. Um, also, I like how they have a backstage migration. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, super competitive, but uh, but hey, uh, I like that. Um, the, I think uh, you brought up Argonaut, right? And we had Surya on, on the pod last year. We did, uh, Just yeah. FI, FII on the, on the ecosystem. I think Surya has decided to pivot. So Argonaut, if you are a customer, I think they're still supporting you, but now they're working on something that's really cool that's helping you accelerate your build pipeline. So go check them out with what build. Uh, but yeah, just in, just since we discussed them. Uh, and then yeah, I, I mean, there, and there's nothing on the website that says like it's going away. And I wonder because it's open source, right? Yeah. Or at least a lot of it is whether it'll just kind of stay. I mean, yeah. but, but it's a good contrast to Cortex, right? Argonaut yeah. is... is focused a lot more on the infrastructure automation and and building of stack of tools right yeah. so you can go from zero to uh kubernetes cluster on cloud with a lot of the um tools that you need to do CICD, to do deployment to do testing to do security yeah. all that stuff um from the get-go right whereas you know, I don't think it has all the other stuff in terms of like messaging and docs and all that yep. stuff, but um, definitely focused more on uh, the developer and infrastructure side a lot more. Um, but yeah, really cool stuff. Go check that out. The This kind of bleeds into the Atomi, which I'm referencing Atomi Core by Redcube. So they have an enterprise version too, but okay. Atomi Core is similar to the Argonaut play in the sense that it's, it's definitely um, focuses a little more on the infrastructure and tooling, but it does a couple of things that are really cool, right? It, it layers on this uh, really nice UI. So it builds all this stuff in together. So everything's very self-serve multi-tenant. Mm-hmm. You can kind of create your own teams and all this stuff. Um, and it, it focuses on a lot of the CNCF projects. So it, it, yeah. it deploy Istio, it'll deploy, you know, all these oh, other nice. things. Yeah. So, I mean, everything where I think I was able to try it recently and like in 30 minutes, I was able to get a full um, setup of it and, I took one of the applications I used, uh, like developed at Portworx and just made uh-huh. it all work there. And you get out of the box, you get like full tracing and performance. And I didn't really have to think about it. Right. So this is this cognitive load thing where if I were to build a Kubernetes cluster and add all these layers uh-huh. or tracing and logging and, you know, uh, deployment and canary te- canary builds and those kind of things, each individual, one of those probably take me weeks. Yep. You know, it took me 30 minutes. So that, that's the <laughs> idea that I think most of these share, most of these IDPs that we're talking about share. Yeah. Um, and I think and this sounds yeah. similar to the Cube First episode that we did last year, right? When when we had the co- sure. co-founders from Cube First, like it's yeah, that that's right. first 30 minutes, you give us yeah. your cloud credentials, we'll set up everything based on the CNCF ecosystem. I like that. Yeah. The, the the difference is, I, uh, Tommy, you point at uh, your cluster. So oh, okay. A cluster for you. Gotcha. Um, okay. So it does differ a little bit. I don't know if, yeah. I couldn't remember if it does, but anyway, um, so those are two like different ends of the spectrum and backstage again, um, definitely falls closer (laughs) towards, um, the, the cortex side of things. Um, and backstage is quite a behemoth of, of a thing, but very also well known, right? It offers a lot of features, um, a lot of integrations, Mm -hmm. a lot of plug. So plugins, we didn't really talk about either, right? IDPs can allow, 
<clears throat> um, pluggable architectures in the sense that you want to use some other enterprise tool mm -hmm. um, with this, right? Maybe it's in the other IDP. <laughs> Identity nice. provider, you know? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, bring it around, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, brought it full circle. <laughs> Getting down. You know, just trying to go back to this comedy routine that, yeah. that we were talking about at the beginning. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, uh, your, your IDP doesn't have to give you um, an IDP. Wow, that's confusing. But anyway, uh, the point being, it's gotcha. pluggable architectures, right? Super pluggable yeah. and backstages and um, quite a big product in terms of uh, what what you can do with it. I so, know you, you brought up Rodi. I know Red Hat also built like a backstage based enterprise solution with their developer hub. So backstage is super popular. If, if you have a day zero event named after your open source project, I think you have made it like day zero event at, at KubeCon <laughs> backstage con. I think, yeah, that, that, that's, that's a good enough, uh, I guess, adoption rate for you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it, that's a good point. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like th this list might not be complete. Oh, I, even for the vendors that are in the ecosystem right now. But next one, when we have KubeCon Europe, we'll see more names pop up. Oh, it's certainly not complete, stealth. right? Yeah. I'm, I find new names all the time. Yeah. Um, it's just so hard to keep up. I mean, how many are on this list right now? It's like... Uh, Still are. It's, it's Only if you would have yeah. used like numer <laughs> numbers instead of alphabets. Come on. <laughs> I'll, I'll switch it. I'll switch it right now while, while we're sitting here. Um we go. do it live. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's all messed up. So oh, 18. Okay. I can do some math, right? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. 18. And, you know, and that's not com comprehensive, yeah. like you said, but um, it's yeah. quite a bit of, of them. So, um, anyway, circling back, I think um, something Backstage does that's really uh, differentiates from a lot of them is, you know, creating sort of a techs, tech docs or docs mm -hmm. as a service type of thing where, yeah. you know, as the develop uh, IDP and you're working together with teams, you know, docs are so, so, so important. Um, so um, being able to have that built in and kind of um, all be aligned and have good docs and have it built in as an add-on feature, right? So that's... Oh, you know, you know what I want to see? Like, I think... Uh, I've seen this as like the AI startup ecosystem uh, where you give it your code base and it generates docs for you. So developers yeah. don't have to do it. Man, integrate that into an IDP. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it's one of these things that, so I've, I've seen AI do these kind of, I've seen AI uh, also like write uh, like unit tests and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yep. The thing is, is like, you don't, um, and maybe it's just me being not familiar or uh, familiar enough, but you know, AI can also be too fine grain, right? So you say, yeah. Hey, write unit tests of things. And it pumps out like a thousand lines <laughs> of unit tests that like test the smallest little things. Yeah. And you're like, that's, you know, and then what happens is you make one change and like half your unit tests break. Right. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so there's like human intervention still. And, and I fear that with docs where it's like, Whoa, like <laughs> you can, you can mess up docs, right. If they're too dense to those kind of things, but in True. general, like, yeah. yeah, having this kind of built in or, you know, IDPs have chatbots, right? So yeah. like, um, copilot, all the stuff kind of built into your coding practices. That's, I think, be going to become standard for a lot of these, especially like uh, the ones, the, the ones that are a little more the further along, but. Anyway, we're 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 gonna kind of stop here with the <laughs> the amount of names. We're not gonna go through all eighteen. Yeah. We will add the list of all those to the show notes if you're interested mm -hmm. in kind of taking a look at some of the ones we talked about or investigating some of the other ones we yeah. did not go into depth. Um, you know, they're all going to be focused in this IDP sense of the word that yeah. we covered today, right? A lot of the topics we covered today, they'll, they'll be fine of um, trying to give you that in some yeah, way, shape, and, or form. And if you find anybody on that list that you want to learn more about, just hit us up, right? We can, we can reach out to people and, and have them on the podcast to dive deeper uh, into any one of these tools. So we, we yeah. can do that. Yeah. And if it, um, you know, if you're from one of these companies, and want to talk to us, we'd be happy to do that as well. Or if you're just a regular uh, listener, I say regular, it's not a bad thing. Um, if you're a listener and want to hear <laughs> more about IDPs because you're doing this at work or you're you're interested, also let us know. Uh, yeah. We have a little bit of a series of this types of topic that we're kind of focusing on. Um, so yeah, let us know. That'd be super, super helpful. And um, thanks for staying. If you've made it this far, thank you dedicated listener yeah. we appreciate you. <laughs> nice. no I, I think i need like i need to ask you a favor and you should do the closing this time 
<laughs> oh, by myself? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I can pitch in with my name, and but that's it. But yeah, by, by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All huh. right. Well, again, join our Slack. Head over to KubernetesBytes.com if you haven't seen our new website. It's been yep. up for a few months now, but you can do all things like join our Slack, listen to episodes, watch our videos, all in one place. Super mm-hmm. fun. Uh, or get in touch with us. That also works. So um, go ahead and do that, and we'll see you over there. Thanks for those who have joined the Slack already community. We will promise to be a little more active on there. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. If you have any suggestions, please go over there. All right. So that brings us to the end of today's episode. I'm Ryan. I'm Bobbin. And thanks for joining other episodes of Kubernetes Bytes. Thank you for listening to the Kubernetes Bytes podcast. 